made up of dominated countries and peoples. As Samir Amir has stated, during all the stages of capitalism, the plunder of the resources of the peripheries, the oppression of colonized peoples, their direct or indirect exploitation by capital remain the common characteristics of the phenomenon of colonialism. Indigenous peoples were the first casualties of this inhumane system, but we certainly are not the last ones, nor are we the only ones. The crises we are in today are no surprise to Indigenous peoples. From the time of invasion, Indigenous people understood that the ways of the invaders were incompatible with life. They were incompatible with life not only because they launched relentless assaults on our people and homelands, but also because the exploitation required to fuel economic growth and expansion could not be sustained indefinitely. Indigenous people knew that Europeans and European Americans were heading in a suicidal direction, that someday even they would be forced to realize the lunacy of their actions. We are at that point today. Life before invasion and colonization was different for our peoples. As Lakota spiritual leader John Fire Lame Deer wrote, before our white brothers arrived to make us civilized men, we didn't have any kind of prison. Because of this, we had no delinquents. Without a prison, there can be no delinquents. We had no locks nor keys, and therefore, among us, there were no thieves. When someone was so poor that he couldn't afford a horse, a tent, or a blanket, he would, in that case, receive it all as a gift. We were too uncivilized to give great importance to private property. We didn't know any kind of money, and consequently, the value of a human being was not determined by his wealth. We had no written laws laid down, no lawyers, no politicians. Therefore, we were not able to cheat and swindle one another. And with his classic sense of humor, he wrote, we were really in bad shape before the white men arrived. And I don't know how to explain how we were able to manage without these fundamental things that, so they tell us, are so necessary for a civilized society. If you know anything about indigenous life today, you know that our health, well-being, and freedoms have deteriorated significantly since living under colonial occupation. We have seen all life deteriorate under colonial occupation. Within my homeland of Minnesota Makoche, for example, since colonial occupation, we have witnessed the destruction of 90% of our wetlands, 98% of our big woods, and 99% of our prairies. At the current rate of destruction, we have the very real concern that life will no longer be sustained within any of our ecosystems. Yet because there are still more profits to be drawn from continued exploitation, Every day, more lands are plowed and drain tiled to support a few more acres of industrial monocrop agriculture. Every day, more pesticides and fertilizers are dumped on these crops. Every day, more lumber is cut from our forests, more iron is mined from our mother, and more toxins spew from coal and nuclear power plants. This is what has resulted from colonial occupation. Given this history, I would like to add my voice to the voices of other indigenous peoples who have called for a name change of the Occupy movement and Occupy Oakland specifically. When these movements use the language of occupation, it invokes all the destruction of the last 519 years. It precludes indigenous involvement because indigenous people from all over the world, from Australia, from Africa, from New Zealand, from South America, Central America, North America, from Palestine, any population living under occupation will cringe at that word. If you truly seek to align yourselves with the marginalized and with the dispossessed, it's imperative that you reject the language and ideology of the capitalistic colonial enterprise. Today, I encourage you to immediately abandon the language of occupation 
and instead replace it with decolonizing language that distinguishes you from the builders and players of Wall Street. Further, if you are just interested in simply acquiring your fair share of the economic pie, I hope you understand that this would only be a short-lived solution to a major economic crisis that is just one crisis among many. With the U.S. owing $14 trillion in rolling debt and reaching 100% of the yearly GDP, with European countries facing bankruptcy, we are witnessing the end game of capitalism. The paradigm of unlimited growth is inherently unsustainable. It always has been. But this truth is finally catching up to American society. Given the realities of peak debt and peak oil, we're now facing the collapse of the American economy and the collapse of civilization more broadly. These combined with the crises emerging from global warming, climate change, and the collapsing of ecosystems due to hyper-exploitation mean that it is time for everyone to recognize the harm of the existing systems and institutions and to seek to dismantle them completely to save all life before it is all destroyed. You will not find your justice in capitalism. You will not find your justice in the colonial government of the United States. You will find justice when the institutions of capitalism and colonialism are destroyed and they are replaced by sustainable ways of being that nurture and protect all life. because there's no way in hell I want to follow that. <laughs> Can you speak a little louder? Sorry. Okay. Um, you almost have to yell into it. So, uh, I want to just uh, reinforce a couple of things that, that she said and then move on. Um, and as the last few weeks, a lot of people have been throwing around the word occupation, as in Wall Street occupation, occupied DC, occupied Oakland. Mic check. Oh, damn it. Um, could you? Um, Jesus yeah, Christ. Perfect. Um, okay, so I just want to start off by saying that the occupations, I think, of course, are, of course are very good. And any resistance against the corporate machine is good. But we need to remember that the occupations are taking place under a much larger occupation. We need to remember at all times that we're living on stolen land. This protest is taking place on stolen land. Yeah. Oakland is founded on stolen land. Woo. The Bay Area is founded on stolen I land. Hear you, can't hear you. Oh, you missed some really good lines. <laughs> Do the people's mic? Yeah. People's mic! No, no, no. no, just. No, that would take us like three hours. Um, <laughs> there, how do you like that? Uh, the entire omnicidal economy is founded on stolen land. You know, would it be better if I just shout? Yes. Yeah, stand up and shout. Shout. Okay, can you hear this okay? Yeah. Is that better? Which is better? Okay. Like combination. Okay, hey, 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 no, 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 we're going to... We have to come to consensus, so let's take a <laughs> so, uh, Okay, this. And not up. this. Up to three. Shout out to the The people have spoken. Can you stand, please? Perfect. Now yell, and you're good. Okay, okay. Um, so, what is a government of occupation? What does it do? A government occupation facilitates resource extraction and maximizes production at the expense of communities of the natural world. That's what they do, by definition. So, um, the United States, what does the United States government do? 
It facilitates resource extraction and maximizes production at the expense of communities of the natural world. The United States is functionally, systematically, a government of occupation. And capitalism is functionally, systematically, an economics of occupation. And of course, all my American Indian friends say, uh, what took you so long to figure this one out? And once again, just look around. Um, where we're standing here is supposed to be oak forest. Where are the original inhabitants? Where are the grizzly bears? Where are the delta smelt? Where are the salmon? Where are the original human inhabitants? San Francisco Bay has collapsed. When the first whites here appeared here, whales were abundant, as were ducks, as were geese, as were so many others. There are still sea lions, but the first Spanish conquerors encountered so many, it looked like the beaches were paved with sea lions. This culture steals land bases from all their inhabitants, human and non-human alike, and then destroys them. That's what it does. We need to never forget that, and if we are to survive, we need to stop the planetary murder. In the reports I've seen of the various protests, I've seen a lot of people talking about jobs, and a lot of people talking about corporate greed, and a lot of people talking about sharing the wealth, but I haven't seen a lot of people talking about the fact that the entire system, the entire system is based on land theft and on destroying the natural world. I think that needs to be the start of our conversations, because it should be painfully clear that the health of the planet is primary, far more important than any economic system, in part because without a living planet, you have no economic system whatsoever. You cannot consume a planet and live on it. Only someone deeply insane, or an economist insofar as any difference, could think so. <clears throat> Asking for a bigger piece of the pie on a planet being murdered is a wee bit insufficient. And the wonderful thing is that these conversations are starting. By you being here, you are starting these conversations and starting the movement to end this larger occupation. <clears throat> so I'd like to start by thanking you for being here and thanking all the protesters, thanking all the revolutionaries, thanking all of you who are here doing this good and great thing, this honest and true thing, this mighty and righteous thing. Those of you who are holding hands through time and across space with those who have fought for freedom and justice, with John Brown, with Frederick Douglass, with Tecumseh, with the Wobblies and the Suffragists, with Helen Keller, with civil rights workers and union members, with Ken Sarawi, with, with people in Arab Spring, with people the world over who are fighting for the right of self-determination, with the poor and the landless, with indigenous peoples fighting for their land, with groups like the Movement for the Emancipation of the Niger Delta fighting to stop transnational corporations and the governments who serve them from destroying their land and its people. I'd like to thank all of you who are here because you understand that unless we wrest power away from corporations, unless this culture is stopped, that it will, for all practical purposes, end life on Earth. 200 species were driven extinct today, and 200 yesterday, and 200 the day before that. 90% of the large fish in the oceans are gone. 98% of the native forests, 99% of the native prairies. Salmon are depending upon you, as are tigers and orangutans and coral reefs, monarch butterflies and red-legged frogs, western lilies and wild bison and Florida panthers. Of course, this corporate culture kills humans too. Human languages and human cultures are being driven extinct at an even faster relative rate than wild species. Capitalism and imperialism kill more than a million human children per year. That's almost two each and every minute, each and every day. Corporations are killing the planet, and they are killing us. We have long been taught that the legal system is set up to protect us, but we have been lied to. It is well established that judicial accountability does not extend to those who maim or kill in the name of business, nor to those who impoverish our land bases. Since the legal system won't hold destructive institutions accountable, the responsibility falls on each of us. This means that all of us who care about salmon, for example, must learn to be accountable to salmon rather than loyal to political and economic institutions that do not serve us well. The same is true for those who care about the San Francisco Bay, for those who care about democracy, for those who care about communities, for those who care about the future, for those who care about any living being. And we must act on this loyalty. We must do whatever is necessary to protect our homes and our land bases from those who would destroy them. Only then will salmon be saved and for us. Only then will toxic dumping be stopped. Only then will we have democratic self-governance. Only then will we have a future. Because allowing destructive economic or political entities to destroy our land base is not merely unethical and unwise, but suicidal. 
The Declaration of Independence states that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it. It would be more precise, however, to say that it is not the right of the people, nor even their responsibility, but instead something more like breathing, something that if we fail to do, we die. If we as a people fail to rid our community of destructive institutions, those institutions will destroy our community. And if we as a community cannot provide meaningful and non-destructive ways for people to gain food, clothing, and shelter, then we must recognize it's not just specific destructive institutions, but the entire economic system that's pushing the natural world past breaking points. Once we've recognized the destructiveness of this economic system, we have no choice unless we wish to sign our own and our children's death warrants, but to fight for all we're worth and in every way we can to overturn it. There's nothing else to do. So you can ask, by quoting the Declaration of Independence, am I calling for revolution? To which I will respond that the answer should be clear. You can then ask if this means that I am calling for the overthrow of the United States government. To which I will respond that this question comes far, far, far too late. The government was long since overthrown, and those who overthrew it are known as ExxonMobil, British Petroleum, Halliburton, Monsanto, ADM, Walmart, Massey Coal, Goldman Sachs, Citibank. They are the real governors, and the United States government is a wholly owned subsidiary, brought to you by McDonald's, Pfizer, and Lockheed Martin. So then you can ask, am I advocating the overthrow of a government that is by foreign of corporations? Am I advocating the overthrow of the corporate state? To which I'll say, hell yes. <laughs> So earlier, I thanked all of you for being here, um, but I want to be clear that my gratitude doesn't extend to everybody here. Um, and I want now to speak to the exceptions. And I don't know if they can hear this, but I have a different message for the police. All right. Which is this. There have been scores and then hundreds and then thousands of accounts of Egyptian and Syrian police and military personnel who not only refused to attack protesters, but who joined them. I have heard of only one account of police officers in the United States who refuse to do violence to, that is to assault, to attack, or to arrest, because an arrest is violent as well, American citizens. It was in Albany, New York. Yeah. Let's be clear about what this means. With the exception of police in Albany, New York, I have yet to hear of a single police officer in the United States who's had the courage and the integrity to do what so many in Egypt and Syria have done. So let me ask it this way of the police. How does it feel to be more repressive, less courageous, and have less integrity and honor than security forces in open military dictatorships? <laughs> I didn't get around to this, but I seriously considered making a whole lot of little yellow paper badges hand out to police officers, each one saying, I serve the corporate state. All right. So if the police had integrity and honor and courage, they would turn around their guns and aim them at the capitalists who are destroying what's left of this country's democracy. <laughs> and they were destroying what's left of life on the planet. I've heard reports that in some cities like Washington, D.C., the behavior of police has not been as appalling and repressive as it has been in others, like Oakland or New York. I've heard reports that in some cities like Washington, D.C., the behavior of police has not been as appalling and repressive as it has been in others, like Oakland or New York. But we all have to admit that not beating or shooting or pepper spraying protesters is a pretty low standard. <laughs> I actually suggest a much higher standard. Join us. Yeah. try to give them an injection of some of the courage and integrity and honor that they are thus far completely refusing to manifest, I want to explore a few examples of police and military who have had, the cur who have had that courage and integrity. In the Great Railroad Strike of 1877, militia in Pittsburgh refused to fire on strikers. In Harrisburg, PA, the militia shook hands with protesters and gave them their guns. Let's see if that happens. In 1917, the Tsar's police refused to shoot at protesters in Petrograd. In the 1930s in the UK, police not only refused to arrest protesters, but stood in solidarity with them. In 1990, First Nations people in Canada blockaded rail lines, and when the Canadian government ordered the police to break the blockade, 
the local constabulary refused to follow orders. Of course, the peaceful revolutions in Eastern Europe were made peaceful because the police opened their arms and their armories to the resistance. Others have done it. You, police officers, would not be the first, nor by any means the last. Have that courage. One man in Syria said, we received the order from our officers to shoot at anything that moved, even unarmed children and the elderly in Harasta. We got close to them, we threw our weapons on the ground and the people protected us. When our officers saw that, they opened fire on us. One of my colleagues was hit in the shoulder, but we succeeded in taking him into hiding. How does it feel to be less democratic and less courageous than police in an autocratic government? Don't let that man's courage put you to shame. Follow his example. Follow the example of the Libyan Air Force members who refused to attack their own people. Follow the example of the 25-year-old Bahraini policeman, Ali Shazim al Ghanimi. When he heard that protesters in Bahrain were being shot by police, he went to the hospital and helped the medics treating the wounded. Dressed in his uniform, he went to the crowd and protesters and publicly announced he would no longer work for the repressive dictatorship. Don't we all wish that the police here had his courage? Yes. These people are facing death for their courage. The police here are not. They're facing what? A departmental memo? Their boss's annoyance? Not death. The police need to refuse to assault protesters, refuse to fire at protesters, refuse to harm protesters, refuse to arrest protesters. They need to do the right thing. And I can think of many reasons why they should join us. The first is that they have far more in common with us than they do with them. We share class interests. Neither of us are the rich. They steal from us like they steal from the, they, they steal from the cops like they steal from everybody else. They poison the cops like they poison us. For all the ruling class's pretty words, the elite hold you, the cops, as like us, members of the working class, the poor, the middle class, in as much contempt as they do others of the disposable, the others of the not rich, the others they use and throw away. Make no mistake, they will throw you away. Look at how they treat military veterans. And here's the point, they destroy your future just like they destroy ours. The second reason the cops should join us is that it's a right and moral thing to do. A couple of years ago, I communicated with a policeman who wanted me to understand that it's the job of police to protect people from sociopaths. I agreed, and then I asked why it is that they don't protect us from rich sociopaths. Right. <laughs> and my African-American friends asked why they so rarely protect African-Americans from racism, from functional racism. And my women friends asked why they so rarely protect women from misogyny. Only 6% of rapists spend even one night in jail. Speaking of misogyny, there's actually something else I need to address which is I've seen many accounts of rapes happening at various occupies, and the response to these rapes by the Occupy movement in general has been appalling. There's been a lot of victim blaming and a near complete refusal to hold rapists accountable. In one city, they were trying to talk women out of reporting the rapes for fear would embarrass the movement. But what's embarrassing is the rapists, and what's embarrassing are the rapes themselves, and what's embarrassing is the response by the Occupy movement to the rapes. In one town, the Occupy movement put out a statement that refused to use gender-specific language about women being raped, saying, quote, if he, she, if he slash she is raped, what the fuck the use is the use of a movement ostensibly aimed at holding the exploiters of Wall Street accountable when so many men in this movement aren't even willing to hold rapists accountable? I know that many of you perceive the cops as the enemy, rightly so. I know that many of the cops have comported themselves as the enemy, but for once make them do their fucking job. Yeah. If a man rapes a woman, and if you are not willing to deal with him as he needs to be dealt with, then for crying out loud, turn him over to the cops. Wow, that went over well. <laughs> um, oh, here's an interesting question. If you did turn a rapist over to the cops, do you think the cops would beat the rapist? No. They'd arrest me huh. for calling them up. So, if they won't beat a rapist and they'll beat a protester, what does that say about their priorities? Okay, what I want for everybody here to do, I want everybody at this particular place to pledge right now in public that you'll have a zero tolerance policy for the abuse of women. Right now, I want every man to raise your hand and say out loud, I will not rape and I will not tolerate rape. I will not rape and I will not tolerate rape. You know, that's probably the first time in the history of the planet that 200 men have said that at the same time. I was hoping that there would be cops closer because I was going to ask them to raise their hands for this too. 
but uh, I strongly suspect they wouldn't have. Um, I had a whole nice set of jokes There's associated with that. What? There's probably a few in this crowd. Yeah, okay. Would any, um, would any undercover cops please raise your hand? <laughs> it's going to work one of these days. Uh, okay, but now I want to go back to the idea of the police. And I got a question for them, another question, which is why don't you protect us from these sociopaths? I'm not just talking about rapists, but about capitalists. Why, when there's a strike, do the cops protect the capitalists from the strikers? Why do they not protect the strikers from the capitalists? They use their batons on strikers. Why don't they use their batons to force capitalists to come to terms? Can you imagine, like, one of those G20 things or IMF things, if all the cops suddenly turned around and put their guns on the, uh... Why do you not do your job and protect us from them? Why have you not arrested Tony Hayward for murdering humans in the Gulf of Mexico and for murdering the Gulf of Mexico? Where were you when Massey Cole murdered miners? And where are you when Massey Cole murders entire mountains? Where are you when chemical companies kill so many people, so many children, the entire region's called Cancer Alley? And where were you when our democracy was stolen? Why aren't you doing your job? Of course, we can ask these same questions, not just of police, but of ourselves. If the cops won't do the job to stop the sociopaths, then we're the ones who have to do it. And frankly, if the cops don't have the courage to help, at the very least, they should have the common decency to get out of the way. Yeah. Oh, oh. So here's a couple riddles, not very funny. Question. <laughs> what do you get when you cross a long drug habit, a quick temper, and a gun? Answer. Two life terms for murder, earliest release date, 2026. Question. What do you get when you cross two nation states, a large corporation, 40 tons of poison, and at least 8,000 dead human beings? Answer, retirement with full pan benefits. That's Warren Anderson, CEO of Union Carbide, Bhopal. Here's another one. What do you call someone who conspires to put poison in the subways of Tokyo? Answer, a terrorist who's put in prison for life. Question, what do you call someone who conspires to put poison in water supplies in the United States? Answer, Dick Cheney. <laughs> An oil and gas man, a fracker, a capitalist. Or if the specific poison is cyanide, we call it a transnational gold mining corporation. Just to make sure we get it, what consequence does someone pay for murdering humans and non-humans in the Gulf of Mexico? Answer, a million dollar a year severance package and millions of shares of British Petroleum stock. The guy shouldn't receive stocks, he should be put in them. So the real question is, um, who are the cops protecting and who are they serving? It's not we the people when corporations rule. And we all know that corporations run the government. I ask people all over the country, does the government take better care of human beings or corporations? Nobody ever says humans. Most people laugh. It's a ridiculous question. Of course the government takes better care of corporations than it does human beings. So what would happen if, with or without the cops' help, we were to join to enforce cancer-free zones, oil spill-free zones, extinction-free zones, home foreclosure-free zones. Hell, we could enforce rape-free zones, hunger-free zones, economic and political democracy zones. I wonder if these zones were to extend across, all across the country. I guess it's called a revolution, isn't it? Uh -huh. <laughs> so here's a question for all of us. If you're going to have a government, and if you're going to have a government that's worth a good goddamn, whom should the government serve? Corporations or human beings? Human beings. Well, that's awfully tepid. <laughs> um, In the environment. Um, so it's like, who should protect? Humans or corporations? And it's like, humans! humans! That's better. <laughs> um, let's try it one more time. Who should, go, who should the government serve? Corporations or human beings? Humans! Fish! Send human beings! That true. Um, so that actually the sound of all your voices here is the third reason that the cops should join us because I know the cops want to be on the winning side and uh, we're sure as hell going to win. Yeah. So when a government becomes destructive of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it. And it's long past time we made full use of our rights.
Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Right now, scientists are debating whether a quarter, a third, it devours with an entitlement so profound, it is turning our planet to dust. That dust is not hyperbole. The dust storms in China are so bad, they are creating asthma in children in Denver, Colorado. So I have three questions. What is that murder made of? Who's in charge? And how do we stop them? Now, none of that is cognitively challenging. Emotionally daunting, sure. Uh, ideologically problematic, maybe. But intellectually, it's a no-brainer. There are three overlapping systems that have created a feeding frenzy of destruction. The first is called civilization. Now, civilization means simply people living in cities. But what that means is they need more than the land can give. So food, water, energy, they have to come from somewhere else. From that point forward, it doesn't matter what lovely, peaceful, nonviolent values people hold in their hearts. That society is dependent on imperialism and genocide because no one willingly gives up their land, their water, their trees. But since the city has used up its own, it has to go out and get those from somewhere else. And that's the last 10,000 years in one sentence. Indigenous people in North America have been surviving that precise genocide for 500 years. It's not history. It's not the past. They're still here, and they could use some solidarity. They've asked for something. They've asked for you to reconsider the word occupy, and I think you should do it. Oakland is the flagship for this movement. If you do it, others will follow. And oh! Oh! many good words to choose from. Right? You could be decolonize Oakland. You could be resistance Oakland. Take your pick. But I hope you will listen to the indigenous. It's a simple request and it would build a whole lot of solidarity. The second system is capitalism. Now capitalism takes living creatures and their homes. It declares them private property. It turns them into dead commodities and then it accumulates those commodities into wealth. It's a pyramid scheme of death. Now this movement has staked a claim on being the 99%. I think that's self-evident. Capitalism is the 1% taking from the 99%. But add this, 98% of the old growth forests are gone. 99% of the world's prairies are gone. That means 99% of the posk flowers and 99% of the prairie dogs and 99% of the bison. The wealth is created from their dead bodies. The point isn't to distribute the wealth, it's to stop the death while there's still something left alive. The third system is the ruling religion of the planet, which is called patriarchy. Now patriarchy takes human beings who are biologically male and creates a class of people called men. Men are made by socialization to masculinity, and that's a psychology built around entitlement, especially to another class of people called women. At its core, masculinity is a violation imperative. Now, this is not natural. It was not created by God. It's a corrupt and brutal arrangement of power. According to Amnesty International, the most traumatic form of torture is rape. Now, you could read about that in Amnesty's materials. You could also just listen to women. Now, there is some segment of this movement that believes that the proper response to the most traumatic form of torture is to sit in a circle and talk to the perpetrator. That might be appropriate if someone had stolen a cupcake. But I got news for you. Women are not cupcakes. So men, you have two choices. You can lay down your weapons and pick up your humanity and stand with women. The truth is that as long as domination is eroticized, as long as anyone is socialized to that violation imperative, you're not safe either. One in seven boys is sexually abused. That's a whole lot of rape. So some of you already know that I'm telling the truth, and I'm sorry that you had to learn that. It is horrible each and every time. The world should stop turning, and I don't know why it doesn't. But you have a choice now, and the question is, are you gonna say, do it to her instead. 
Or are you going to say, no, it stops here. You don't do it to anyone, not ever. And to women, we don't have a choice. If you were born female, you were born on a battlefield. You will be punished for saying that out loud. But the grim truth is, you're going to be punished anyway for the sin of being female. Battering is the most commonly committed crime in the United States, not violent crime in the United States. Uh, it's every 18 seconds a man beats a woman. That is more hatred than I can comprehend. So right now, that battlefield is such a slaughter, we can't even gather up our wounded. So this is where all three of those systems, civilization, capitalism, and patriarchy, this is where they merge, that violation imperative. That includes breaking the bodies of women and children, the boundaries of rivers and forests and mountains, the DNA of salmon and mice and indigenous people, and finally, the integrity of the atom itself. Put all this together, the entire culture is sociopathic. The entitlement, the sadism, that bottomless hunger to conquer, you'll never reach the end of it. What we are reaching is complete biotic collapse, starting with the least of us. Plankton populations are crashing because of the carbon. The oceans are now too acidic for plankton. Now maybe plankton are too small and green for most of us to care about, but you should know this. Two out of three animal breaths is made possible by the oxygen that plankton produce. So if the oceans go down, we're going down with them. So what do we do? We fight like hell. And all of you are doing something so important by starting. You're breaking through the passivity of the weary, the denial of the desperate, the accommodation of the brokenhearted. You're standing up to say no, enough. That 1%, they're not taking the last scraps of shelter, of health care, of human rights and human dignity, of this planet that is our only home. You're standing in witness to a vast machine that is right now grinding up the future itself. And you took the next step here in Oakland. You shut down the port for a few hours. You did that. You halted the flow of the living to the dead to commodities to wealth. You did it. But we're going to have to do it again. Only this time, it can't be symbolic. We're going to have to mean it. Because we need warriors who will put themselves between what is left of our planet and fossil fuel. We're going to have to bring this down, all of it. The oil, the coal, the clear cuts, the dams, all of it. The entire industrial economy. That will require sustained, committed blockades. Not blockades that make a point, but blockades that make a decisive material impact. Oh, oh! Decisive material impact. stop the trains carrying coal and the tankers carrying the oil and the pipelines carrying the tar sands. We especially stop those. James Hansen says it's game over for the planet if those pipelines go through. Now this is going to mean civil disobedience on a scale the world has never seen. And we're going to have to match their contempt with our courage. We're going to have to match their brute power with our fierce and fragile dreams. We're going to have to match their endless sadism with a determination that will not bend and will not break and will not stop. They arrest us, two more come forward. They hurt us, five more come forward. They kill one of us, and there are thousands ready to take the place of the fallen. Yeah. Oh, oh! This is the last moment to fight. Did you know there are parts of China where there are no longer any flowering plants? No flowering plants. Because the pollinators are all dead. We are on the verge of complete biotic collapse. That is 500 million years of evolution gone. We're out of soil, we're out of species, and we are out of time. And catastrophic climate change has begun. We need to start thinking like a serious resistance movement because this is a war. It may feel like daily life because it's been going on for 10,000 years. The lights are on, the stores are full, I know, but it's a war. And if anyone is left to look back 100 years from now, 
they're going to wonder what the fuck was wrong with us that we didn't fight like hell when our planet was going down now you love something or you wouldn't be here whatever you love it is under assault love is a verb we've got to let that love call us to action thank you writer and activist from Canada, or, or rather I come from a part of the continent that belonged to the Algonquin and the Mohawk, and that's occupied by the state of Canada. First of all, uh, I'd like to say that it's an honor that you've had us speak here in Oakland, a place with such an amazing and strong tradition of political resistance. I've often been inspired, moved, and educated by the stories of resistance that have come from this place over many decades. Uh, so I'd like to share with you a story of resistance, and it takes place here in this country. Um, in this story, an economic downturn has left millions homeless, hungry, and uncertain. After a costly war overseas, millions of veterans are in the same situation, virtually abandoned by the government they serve. In response, people set up in cities across the country, they set up camps, tent cities, and shanty towns in protest. And I'm sure that this sounds very familiar to you. But this story that I'm talking about took place 80 years ago. Uh, the Occupy movement isn't the first time in American history that mass encampments have been set up in cities. In the early 1930s, at the dawn of the Great Depression, hundreds of these camps were set up across America. They were named Hoovervilles after President Herbert Hoover, who was blamed for the Depression. And the biggest of these encampments was in Washington, D.C., where tens of thousands of World War I vets moved in demanding a veteran's bonus that the government had promised but refused to give out. They called themselves the Bonus Army. Um, by the middle of 1932, close to 20,000 people, both veterans and their families, had set up tents and makeshift cities. It was a way uh, of life. A, wa a baby was even born in the camp in Washington. And the only demand was that they wanted what the government had said they would give, that each veteran would get a dollar for every day they spent overseas. So after several months, the president decided that the camp had to go. He said in the police who shot two of the protesters, but the veterans refused to leave. So the president sent in the army, a task force was led by George Patton and by Dwight Eisenhower, who later became the president. So when the army first arrived, the veterans cheered because they thought that their brothers in arms had come to march in support of the veterans. But instead, the army fixed bayonets on their rifles, put on gas masks, and charged the crowd. They used bullets, bayonets, and gas canisters to drive the crowd out. Many of the veterans were injured. A little boy was bayoneted, and that baby who was born in the camp was killed by the army's gas. They drove out the veterans and burned the camp to the ground. Of course, many of the Hoovervilles were attacked. The Hooverville in Seattle was burned down twice by the police, and they rebuilt it each time. That camp lasted 10 years. The veterans of the Bonus Army didn't give up. It'll come back to them in a minute. So I study and write about resistance movements. And for a resistance movement to try to gain and occupy ground over a long period of time is an extremely difficult thing to do. Many movements in history have tried to do this before they're ready and failed. And often it's not till they're very well established that they can actually relieve, re um, resist well-organized well police or soldiers and defend the territory they claim. That's why so many radical movements in the Depression went on the offensive and used direct action and disruptive tactics. They don't just sit and wait for the police to attack at a time that's convenient for the cops. They use their own mobility, initiative, and surprise to put those in power off balance. So at the same time as many in the Depression used the defensive tactics of the Hoovervilles, they used offensive tactics as well. When someone was evicted because they couldn't pay their rent, a team of people would go and install them back into their apartment. There were special gas and electric squads who were reorganized to re-hook up the, electri to the electricity and gas to people whose utilities had been disconnected. And if the government wasn't giving a family the relief services they need, then people would go down and they would occupy the relief office until they got what they needed. 
in Atlanta around the same time as the people in the Washington Hooverville were being kicked out. 23,000 families were taken off the relief rolls because the government said there wasn't enough money. So a thousand unemployed people converged on the courthouse and made them find the funds. These tactics were very successful. And the book Poor People's Movement argues that because poor people have little political leverage, they can only succeed through disruption of the system outside of the electoral politics and outside of government bureaucracy. They win by going on the offensive and they lose when they're co-opted by those in power, when they're convinced to stop causing so much trouble and just go along with the system. The Occupy movement has been very resistant to co-optation, so you've been avoiding that one major trap, that movements uh, that those in power use to neutralize social movements. But remember that movements only win when they can mobilize around concrete short-term goals. That's what gives people practice in resistance. It's what gives them, it was keep the momentum up, uh, and it's what rallies new people to movement. You here in Oakland have already made great progress in this direction with the blockade of the port and the general strike. So if anyone can do this, it's you folks here. Let's get back to the bonus army and the veterans of the Great Depression. Four years after the camp in Washington was burned, the government finally gave in and paid the veterans their bonus. So why did they do this? One reason, of course, was that those who organized the Bonus Army and the Hoovervilles never gave up. Even when they were attacked and evicted, they regrouped, and they fought back, and they tried new things. The other reason was that during the Great Depression, the federal government was increasingly terrified of a revolution. When you have people storming welfare offices and reconnecting their own utilities, and rallying in marches of tens of thousands, it starts to look like a revolution might be imminent. So the government realized that the only way to head it off was to make concessions. People got concessions because the government was afraid of them, because they never gave up. So the Hoovervilles were slowly removed as World War II began, as the economy began to, uh, to grow again, and as programs were put into place to abolish them. It's not going to happen the same way this time. The economy is never going to recover and grow the way it did in World War II. Capitalism is a pyramid scheme, it's a Ponzi scheme. It can only function when it grows, when it continually expands its circle of exploitation. The problem is not a glitch in capitalism, the problem is capitalism itself. And industrial capitalism is reaching the limits of its expansion. Global oil production has peaked. The energy supply will only become tighter and more expensive. The recent economic downturn, many economists believe, is just the first sign of peak oil. But once it truly sets in, the increasing cost and decreasing supply of energy will stall industrial manufacturing and transportation on a global scale. Global capitalism will wither. But this won't happen fast enough to stop global warming on its own. And the first effects of global warming, the worst effects, won't happen until decades after the oil is already gone. There's a lag effect, but once it happens, it's self-perpetuating. The ice caps will melt and release huge amounts of frozen greenhouse gases. The oceans, already emptied out by industrial fishing, will turn acidic and die. And the Amazon rainforest, which currently produces its own climate through transpiring moisture, will turn into a desert. According to a report, from the International Energy Agency this week, we only have about five years to prevent irreversible runaway global warming. This is the conservative International Energy Agency. <coughs> and we have to stop runaway global warming by whatever means we can, whatever means we can muster. If we can't, ecological collapse will wipe out all our other social gains and wipe out any future worth living in. Now we cannot stop this, but only if we have a real resistance movement. What we need is two prongs. On one hand, we need to build local, sustainable, democratic communities in which everyone's basic needs are met. Because when the real crash comes, we won't be able to rely on special squads to hook people's gas back up, because there won't be enough gas. We have to learn how to meet our own needs. And on the other hand, we have to fight to stop global industrial capitalism. We can only win if we shut down the machine. That's the only way to ensure a livable future. So we, what we need is a real resistance movement. And in addition to your movement, there's a movement right now organizing around these ideas called Deep Green Resistance. And there are people today here from that movement handing out flyers, including one called Occupy the Machine. 
which is a plan to occupy the actual physical infrastructure, to shut down the infrastructure that's destroying the planet and that's enriching, uh, the, the, enriching the 1% at the expense of everyone else. Turn down the internal movement, not the physical external movement. Then we talk and read. So the plan in Occupy the Machine is one of the, uh, is one of the first steps in a broader strategy to save the planet. Tomorrow there will be an event called Earth at Risk in Berkeley. Seven people, including ourselves, Aaron Darty Roy, Thomas Lindsay, and Stephanie McMillan, will talk about how to build a resistance movement that can save the planet. It starts tomorrow at 10 a.m. at Wheeler Hall at UC Berkeley, and you can find out more by visiting earthatrisk.net. I hope that you'll join us tomorrow in Berkeley, and I hope that your General Assembly will consider endorsing the statement and occupy the machine, and that you here in Oakland will continue to be leaders in the struggle for justice and freedom, because we'll only win if we fight together for our future and the planet. Thank you.